Martin Luther King's eloquent truth-telling and the sad reality of today, the dream of economic justice, a dream deferred, the gap between rich and poor worse than ever, led me to a young man who lives in Washington, D.C., where he teaches literature and writing at American University. His name is Kyle Dargan, and he wrote this poem, A House Divided. It begins, on a railroad car in your America. In your America, blood pulses within the fields, slow poaching a mill saw's buried flesh. In my America, my father awakens again thankful that my face is not the face returning his glare from above 11 o'clock news murder headlines. In his imagination, the odds are just as convincing that I would be posted on a corner pushing powder instead of poems. No reflection of him as a father, nor me as a son. We were merely born in a city where the ruse beyond our doors were the streets that Shanghai souls. To you, my America appears distant, if even real at all, while you are barely visible to me, yet, we continue stealing glances at each other from across the tattered hallways of this overgrown house we call a nation. I mean, in Washington, D.C., where I live, you know, I, I wake up in Southeast D.C., where the unemployment rate is around 22%, and I go across the city to AU. Um, American University. Right, uh, where, you know, unemployment is 3%. Um, population is very affluent. So, you know, every day I'm forced to deal with those realities um, and reconcile them in my head. And I think, you know, that commute that I have to deal with um, every week uh, comes out in my poetry. Because I feel like often I'm trying to reconcile and make sense of um, these conflicting worlds that geographically um, aren't that very far from each other. Kyle Dargan grew up in Newark, New Jersey, with working parents determined he would escape a deteriorating city and make something of himself. But echoes of the inner city still resonate when Dargan walks through his new neighborhood in Southeast DC. Isn't your neighborhood more or less in the shadows of the capital? I think um, realtors want people to think that, but actually we're, <laughs> we're on the other side of the Anacostia River. Actually, my, my neighborhood now, I saw it listed somewhere on a real estate website as um, Capitol Hill East, and I'm like, that's a bit of a stretch. But, um, you know, if, if Benning Heights was on the other side of the city, it would be Palisades. You know, it would be Georgetown. I mean, beautiful houses, beautiful views. Um, but, you know, that so you're on the other side of the Anacostia, it's not perceived the same way. You know, people mm. live one way on one side of the Anacostia River and another way on the other side. There's a line in the poem that says, where the ruse beyond our doors were the streets that Shanghai souls. Is that your community now? The ruse beyond the door? Or the streets that Shanghai souls? Sure, because I mean, lots of Lots of good kids um, just get caught up in trouble. Um, and that's, I, and at that line, when I'm talking about my father, this is true. You know, my dad, to this day, um, sometimes we talk, and he's like, you know, I'm just really happy you're not one of those knuckleheads out in the corner. And as my father, as, as my father, I can see where he has that concern. But to me, I'm like, that was never really an option. Like, I never really considered that you or my mother would accept that. That's where I come from. But what he says is that's like, no, you don't understand. Like, whatever we wanted, there's to the environment to be contended with. And sometimes you lose to the environment. And that's what you see with a lot of kids. Like, there are lots of good kids that just lose to the environment, you know, not because they want to. You know, you don't, you don't want to be in that situation. You don't want to be dead at 17. You don't necessarily want to have um, multiple kids, you know, at 16, 18. Um, but sometimes the environment leads you down that path. And, you know, as a parent, um, and this, I guess, the big thing for me, because I don't have any children, and the question is, if I have kids, will I stay in Southeast yeah. D.C.? Because, like, do I want to contend with the environment? I want to be there. You know, I want to be a presence, but am I willing to risk my kids for that? I don't know. 
Now, I'm not sure that I understand why you chose to live like that when you could have gotten out and did. Your parents worked hard, you worked hard, you got out. You go to Washington, you have a fine teaching position at an important institution, and you choose, in a sense, to go home again, although it's only a couple of miles away. When I first got to AU, I lived in Glover Park, which some people call Upper Georgetown, which is right around That's AU. Right. Um, very quiet, but none of my neighbors really talked to me. The police would follow me around sometimes, which was fine by me, because I felt like I had a police escort all the time. <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to do anything. And it's that idea of community, like why would I want to live somewhere where none of my neighbors talk to me, most likely because I'm young and my skin is brown. Mm. That's, not, that's not home to me. Um, when I lived in Northwest, if anything, I was constantly reminded of how I was an outsider. When I'm in Southeast, you know, no one, I mean, no one even asked me what I do. Um, I'm just there in the community. If I told them I was a professor, you know, given my age, um, they probably wouldn't even believe me. Yeah, how old um, are you? 32. They would uh, find that <laughs> incredulous, right? Yeah, the reality for many of these kids, like, and I know this is, you know, maybe strange for us, but many of them, like, don't expect to live past 19, 18. So to even think that you're an African-American young adult um, with the profession, um, like even that for many of them is something that they just don't see. I mean, when you have access to many different identities in your community, it gives you something to choose from. You know, you have something else to look at, to aspire towards. So my thing is like, I just want to be another influence in my community. There are others. You said they don't expect to live beyond 18 or 19. Yeah. Like I, I hear them because I ride the bus and, you know, on a Saturday morning, you listen to teenagers talk about which of their friends got shot the night before, um, who died, um, who's still walking around with a coat that has blood um, from one of their friends on them. And it's a casual conversation to them. And I'm going crazy inside listening to this because, you know, it's not normal. It shouldn't be normal. Um, but it is for them. And I think that's where you need, you know, that generational uh, exchange so that someone can come in and say, hey, you know, I know you're living this right lifestyle right now, but this is not normal for you. It shouldn't be normal for you. Does politics make sense in your neighborhood? Well, aside from some people I know having jobs working for the government, I don't think most people in, in, in Southeast D.C. Um, see what happens at the federal level in terms of like having an immediate impact on their lives. You know, one thing that I heard bouncing around around the time that Barack Obama got elected and it's like, oh, this is going to be um, such a symbol for kids, you know, to look up to, you know, to have an African-American president. Um, but, you know, having an African-American president doesn't deal with the drug issues, doesn't deal with the teen pregnancy issues, it doesn't deal with the lack of parenting issues, you know, all those things that maintain the reality, the negative realities, it's not all negative, but the negative realities of Southeast D.C. So I think, you know, people see the capital um, from the other side of the river, but in some ways it's, a, it's a very much a different world. Read for us one of those poems you wrote about those kids where you live. It's called We Die Soon. We Die Soon. This jazz, once you learn it as your own, you will listen to the brassy chatter of old brown men riffing on recent murder. The boy who was killing folks, the one who had the claw hammer, no, in Virginia, the boy slashing women's behinds, no sir, this boy was stabbing people cold. Seated on concave milk crates, or their sweat and engine anointed limbs drooping off a station wagon's trunk door. Muscles slack, save for fingers clutching cold beer. Through appreciation, you will learn to distinguish the hollers of youngins that end in sweet jabs and hand slaps from the hollers that summon lights and sirens up the hill. Electricity drowns the nights the restless birds sing back to the evening gunshots, a magnum's baritone pow. With age, 
you'll come to lament June's music, its melodies of bleeding boys, another uneven tempo of jackings and strong arm thefts omitted from the newspapers. They want to get white folks moving over here. No transcribed tunes. These notes puncture, lodge in vertebrae, make jukeboxes of our spines. This living is to be erect with song and then be bent by it. The poem, We Die Soon, it, it takes its title from the final lines of Gwendolyn Brooks' poem, uh, We Real Cool. Um, and in the poem, Brooks was looking at these truant kids in a pool hall, and she decided rather than judging them, you know, for being children in the pool hall, she was gonna try to explore, well, I wonder what they're thinking about right now. Um, she's gonna try to capture, like, I wonder what they feel without judgment. And so uh, I think for me, um, I guess I wanted to take a similar approach to writing about Southeast DC. Do you read that to your students at American University? No. Um, poems like that, I, I tend to share with the kids from those communities. And, you know, I never see myself as speaking for them because I'm not living their experience. But every once in a while, you know, one of them will ask me, like, are you from here? And I say, no. And it's like, well, you sound like you, you understand it. And I say, well, I'm from, I'm from Newark. It's somewhat similar. But again, you know, I don't live their experience. It's why I try to get them to write, because the world needs to see Southeast DC as they see it. You, you attempted last year to have, a, have them read at the White House. Uh, tell me about that. I guess someone from the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities was looking for a poet in the Washington, D.C. area to, you know, run a program um, that would bring, you know, poetry to kids. And some of the children uh, got to read in front of Michelle Obama at the White House. And it was, it was funny because I think the entire time we were working on this project, they didn't really believe that they were going to go to the White House. The kids. Your yeah. Kid. Um, like we tell them and, they, and they'd, they'd say, yeah, yeah, White House, whatever. You know, yeah, we, we see it all the time on the bus, we ride right past it. But then when they actually got there, and they actually got to meet some of the members um, on the President's Committee, like Kerry Washington, um, their faces like lit up and they got nervous. And I said, you know, don't, don't act nervous now. You were all cool before when you didn't think you were gonna come. So now you're here, just relax and do what you have to do. And they, they did a great job. They did a really great job, I'm proud of them. Do you remember the first poem you ever heard in school? You know, I like to think of hip hop as one of my first advanced English teachers. <laughs> um, I was lucky enough, I had uh, some teachers. Mr. Finley um, was one, he played, uh, Nas has a song, um, you know, whose world is this, the world is yours. And that's sort of like the refrain of the song. And that was a really big moment for me as a, a young African-American kid to hear this rapper tell me that, to ask me this question, you know, whose world is this? And to say, the world is yours. Um, and giving me the space to think about that, you know, think about what does that mean? What does that mean I have access to? What does it mean I can do? Um, and, you know, I saw lots of rappers, I say like Tribe Called Quest, De La Soul, um, artists that were using language to make the world theirs. And even today, because a lot of those, my favorite hip hop albums, they came out when I was 11, when I was 10. So I'm still going back and listening to them as a man and saying, picking out different metaphors, picking out different allusions and saying, oh, that's what that meant. So I'm, I mean, in many ways, I'm still learning from hip hop. Give me an example of an allusion or a metaphor that still resonates and informs your take on the world today. Tribe Called Quest is a song called uh, Check the Rhyme, and in it, uh, Q-Tip Abstract, the rapper, he says, you know, um, you know, if knowledge is the key, then just show me the lock. Okay, if knowledge is the key, then just show me the lock. Got the scrawny legs, but I move just like Lou Brock. And as a kid, you understand, like, oh, yes, like, oh, go to school, because school's important. But as an adult, you realize it's like, you know, no, perspective is important, and, you know, critical thinking is important and the ability to know what you don't know, which is on the other side of the door, you know, 
you unlock one door and there's another door, but then the, that door opens to what you don't know. You have to learn all that before you get to the next door. So seeing that image played out over and over through my life, um, you know, whenever I hear that line, I smile a little bit because I'm like, yeah, I live that. I've been living that, um, you know, for the past 20 years. Tell me about this one and then read it. When I ride the bus, you see a lot of the neighborhood tags. Uh, kids write their different neighborhood crew gang tags uh, on bus seats, on stop signs. And um, one day I saw on the telephone pole, there was a sign advertising rest in peace t-shirts. And I realized like, you know, the kids riding these tags um, on the buses are probably the kids that are gonna have their faces and names on these, you know, rest in peace t-shirts. They're not gangsters, um, they're not uh, hoodlums, they're just boys. Um, and so I wrote this poem, Cruise. Those Clay Terrace boys, those Benning Park boys, those Simple City boys, those River Terrace boys, after hours, those boys, those Shoot and Dash boys, Siren Fed boys, Fatherless boys, Siring boys, Noise them, Urban Reservation, Hunt and Gather boys, Keep the blood on the reservation, Hunt those boys, Saw for X, How many Y's and zombies equal those boys, Give me dap, those boys, My boy, my cousin, No taller than tree trunks, Chopped, those boys, Sundown colorful, watch those boys. Southeast hocus pocus, you see, don't see those boys. Then you read those boys, police blotter those boys. Then their ink those boys. RIP graffiti on white tees those boys. Those clay terrace boys, those Benning Park boys, those river terrace boys, those drama city boys. I'm wondering, can poetry really make a difference when kids are going hungry? Uh, or their friends are being shot at with guns? Or their parents are losing their home? Does poetry hold anything out to them? I think there's, there's solace. I mean, I think some are moved to action, but I think there's unfair pressure put on poetry. Like, I'm glad that people expect so much of it. Um, but you look at I mean, honestly, like you look at Congress right now, I mean, legislation isn't fixing those things. So why would you expect poetry to? I mean, maybe poetry can inspire people to get on their legislators to do something, to fix something in their lives. But I mean, that's, that's the place where poetry operates. It doesn't operate at um, the infrastructure level. It operates at the motivation level. It gets people. And that's why, it's, why I say it's important. You know, if poetry isn't speaking to people, if you can read a poem and it just washes over you, it goes over your head, you don't feel any human connection, um, then I feel like that's a waste of the art form because it could be making that connection with someone, possibly urging them to look at the world differently, to do something differently. That may or may not lead them to taking action, but you know, if you don't try. Kyle Dargan, thank you very much for being with me. Thank you very much, I appreciate it.